Three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, welcome tonight. We have some special guests with us here tonight. It's the first time that Grant has been on camera with all of his assistants together. So I'm here tonight. I'm Nicole Sackage, and we're joined with Sinead Wellahan and Desta Barnaby. And tonight we're continuing our series on ufology, art, and music. And our guest tonight is Mike Cleland. And here I'll read just a quick little bio about you, Mike, and then I'll let you take over and kind of introduce yourself as well. Mike is an avid outdoorsman, illustrator, and UFO researcher. He has written extensively on the subject of alien abductions, synchronicities, and owls. It was his firsthand experiences with these elusive events that have been the foundation for his research. So welcome everybody and welcome Mike. Thanks for being here tonight. You're very welcome. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good, I'm very good. I'm the only, I'm half Canadian. My dad was born in Canada. So I'm, I'm uh, I well, sort of half up to speed with everything going on there, so. Well, I think I'm the only uh, American here from the States. So you guys are all Canadian. You're half, you got me beat. I'm jealous already, so. <laughs> Oh, did someone freeze up? Oh, you are I'd from like, the states. Yeah, I'm from I'm from Illinois. You may have to reboot, Nicole. You're you're breaking up. Okay, well, you take over, and I'll try to reboot. Try try quick. again. Okay, okay. So, well, Nicole from uh, the land of um, uh, Lincoln. I always say that she may be the great granddaughter of Abraham Lincoln. But um, she's, she's gone to reboot, and uh, my name is Grant Cameron, and I'm good friends with uh, Mike Cleland, and I wanted to bring him on because um, we're doing this series on art, and um, I know that, that Mike had done a lot of art, so I want to bring him on, but he has a lot of good stories. I've always said he has one of the uh, best stories, some of the best stories I've ever heard in ufology, and he's a good storyteller, and I'll just tell one, because Mike may not remember this story, but... Um, my assistant Sinead is here and she's into numbers and Mike is also into numbers. So I do recall, Mike, we were together in, in Eureka Springs and you were giving your lecture. I think it started at 11 o'clock in the morning and then you were finished and you and I, your girlfriend, and I think Desta was there. I think Desta mm -hmm. was with us. Yeah, that's where I met Desta. Yeah. And so we, we were going for, for lunch and then you came off the stage and you said, Grant, what time do you think my lecture ended? And I went, I don't know. And he went, 1234, one, two, three, four. And then we went, so we go to the restaurant and we're in the restaurant. And then we were, we were had we had lunch or whatever in this beautiful restaurant at Eureka Springs, and then we came out and I remember uh, there was the numbers at the at the uh, at the desk at the uh, where the, where they signed the people in. It was like one two three four on the on the on the counter, and then I he, and then you go look at this one two three four, and then I go hey that's pretty cool. Like to me it was like the synchronicity was just unbelievable. And then your girlfriend goes. Oh, this goes on all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to first do music, and then I want to get into some of your other stuff and what you're working on now and your podcast, because um, as I say, and I, I mean this seriously, I mean, you are one of the best storytellers in the business, and you're a very gentle guy that I think anybody would really latch on to and believe. So let, let's start with art. Um, we're doing this thing. So is there is there a um, what we're believing, that there's a connection between – UFO experiencers and people who end up being artists or musicians. We did we did the musicians, but now we're doing artists. Well, the short answer is yes. I have never done like quantitative research and put it all on a big spreadsheet and tried to solve it. But one of the questions I ask when I talk to people, I have a kind of a set list of questions, you know, beyond like, when did you see the, the experience, the event and stuff. But one of the questions I always ask is, do, are you a creative type? You know, do you do... Do you draw? Do you paint? Do you do poetry? Do you write music? Do you, and it's it's nearly a hundred percent. So wow. I'm going to be really cautious saying it's a hundred percent, but it's pretty close. And then at the same time, you know, someone you know like maybe does something creative, and but the number of people who play music or paint is is pretty remarkable. And then there's also the folks that um. Well, Christopher Bledsoe is a good example that just started drawing yeah. right after his contact event. Yeah. That's that's rare, but not unheard of in the field where people will have these experiences where they'll 
they'll begin drawing or painting or something like that, or music, started playing a musical instrument shortly after what would be a powerful contact event. Um, I've been drawing since I was a little kid and I can't say that it's directly, directly tied in, but um, I've been working as an illustrator since I was 16. So that's, you know, uh, most of my life. And, and I have, um, I went to art school and, um, and I think, so this is, you know, I'm wondering whether the art type, the art person, the, the sort of the temperament of the artist would allow them to be a little more open, right? So the banker might not want to talk about it. You know, the lawyer might not want to talk about it publicly, but the artist has got nothing to lose. So they're talking about it, their own experiences. Um, and so, you know, I kind of think about that and I factor that in a little bit, but I would say that the the, in the, so the other question I ask, which is, I think is uniquely tied in is, you know, so one of the, is, you know, before your event, after your event, how did your spirituality change? And so for me, the art and spirituality are kind of meshed together, you know, that there's a, so people will often say, oh, my spirituality totally changed. And possibly that leaves them really open to doing art. But I know a lot of painters who paint their own experiences or, um, you know, that their contact experiences are kind of intertwined with their paintings. It's not so much that they're painting flying saucers, but that they're, or aliens, but they're painting from a more altruistic or spiritual framework, if that makes sense. And so that, I'm generalizing a little bit, but I'm I would say safely that, that that's a that's a real factor that shows up in the in the field. People who have contact events, people who um, uh, uh, abduction events would then go on to paint, or their spirituality would change. You know, paint, music, write, so all those things. Yeah, so you you attribute like I always attribute it to the right brain left brain thing where artists artists and musicians are more sort of right brain open visual. So in in your number of people that you've you've done a lot of experiencers, I think you work the same as me. Is you spend a lot of time talk, talking to experiencers? Mm -hmm. Do you get many bankers, artists, uh, no bankers and uh, say engineers and these sort of real left brain people, or is it mostly sort of? Um, sort of the right brain people that you put in that artistic thing? Mm, I've certainly got some, but I would have to say mostly it's it's people who are on that on the artistic end of the spectrum. So uh -huh. the right brain, yeah. So I that and that's this anecdotal for me. And also like I've got like a like I'm coming from a place of exploring this creatively and exploring this as a almost, you know, the stuff with all the owls and things like that. I'm pretty fringy. Like I'm not a nuts and bolts guy. So I feel like I'm attracting and, and, and because of that, you know, these, these more artistic folks are arriving on, at, in my email inbox because of that. But certainly there's a, a preponderance of, of uh, creative types in a, in a, just a sprinkling of, of uh, bean counters or whatever term you want to use. Were you always a nuts and bolts, or never a nuts and bolts guy? You were always a sort of a... Well, I mean, you know, like I never, once I started looking into it almost, so when I started looking into my own experiences, it's sort of, I started reading UFO books probably when I was about 29, 30. And, and I really never looked into my own experiences until after I had been looking into, in, you know, and, and one of the very first series of books I read was the trilogy that uh, Jacques Vallée put out, Confrontations, Revelations, and I can't remember the third one. There was three books in a series and they really changed the way I look at it. That and Communion were like, that was like right in the first year of me reading about this stuff. So that really changed the, my, or really um, influenced the foundation of how I look at this stuff. So I guess the answer was no, I was never a nuts and bolts guy. Okay. One last question, then I'll maybe throw it over to Nicole or, or or Sinead to jump in. We talked about this beforehand, and this is your list. Um, you keep this uh, very unique list of traits where you have the thing with the numbers, where you ask about the numbers and the mission. Can you sort of go through this list of, because what we're looking at is one particular aspect where it seems to be 
that a lot of experiencers have this characteristic of art or they've got a musical background or something, but you have a whole another list. Can you go through some of the, the things that you sort of point out that, that pop up all the time when you talk to people? Oh, did we, I just made this list up and I just ran it off the top of my head. So, so what, for one of the first things I ask is, um, you know, what changed, what was going on in your life leading up to the event? And what changed in your life after the event? So oftentimes that's spirituality, that's um, uh, the change in the direction of their life. That'll be, um, you know, oftentimes people have healing. So one of the questions I ask is healing abilities. Do you have, uh, have you been healed or do you have like hands-on healing abilities? And when I do, um, I usually just, I take notes. I don't really take that many notes when I talk to someone on the phone, but I'll write in the corner of the page, I'll write Reiki and I'll just wait. And it's soon like someone will say, so what are you doing for work these days? And they're like, oh, I'm a Reiki therapist or I'm a Reiki master. And I, I, it's not a hundred percent, but it is so close to a hundred percent that it, it, it's beyond chance. I mean, it is nearly everyone I talk to who has like an owl and UFO. So my focus has been this owl stuff. So the people who end up, you know, end up finding me are the people who have had owl experiences. The, the Reiki thing, doing hands-on Reiki healing is is near 100% of the people I talk to somehow do that, which is bizarre. Like I like, that's yeah. certainly not 100% of the population doing Reiki healing, but it's I, think, a healing... I think Ray Hernandez, I think also said the same thing. He said, if I had a dollar for every Reiki healer I run into, I'd be a rich guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's a, the field is full of these people who have this hands-on healing ability. So this healing aspect is part of it. And then um, creativity. Um, have you ever had a near-death experience? Are you psychic? What... Um, uh, your connection to the environment. Um, so those are the questions I'm asking. Are you looking for one in particular? Because I'm doing that list off the top of my head. Yeah, well, you, like you had the one with the number where you ask about... The oh, oh, yeah. So they, I ask if everyone has had a number. And this is really stuff like every... Like you go to a UFO conference and you can just turn to someone and like, just, what's your number? And they'll say, oh, my number's 333. <laughs> and the person next to them will say, my, I'm, I'm 1111. And then um, I asked that of uh, Daryl Anka the guy who uh, channels yeah. Bashar and he just said 10, 10. <laughs> so everyone's got their, and sometimes they're really like, some people are like, Oh, I'm four, 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 <laughs> you know, and it's so everyone seems to have like their little synchronistic number that, that plagues them or follows them around. So. And, you, and yours is one, two, three, four, right? You've got a couple numbers, right? Oh, if I get, so one, two, three is easy. Like you can get one, two, three, if you get one, two, three, four, that's a little, <laughs> that's a little, I, if I get one, two, three, four, five, that's like a showstopper for me. If like that shows up some places, that's just that. So I, there was a, um, this is a little bit of a long story, but uh, I was, um, this is in my third book where I talk about this. There was a woman named Megan and there was a, and, and we had talked a lot and she, I'm going to be very cautious saying this because she's, she hasn't said it outright, but she's certainly, has the kinds of experiences, memories that someone who has had UFO contact would talk about. So I'm not going to go any farther than that. So, and um, I was watching a, there's a movie called Catfish, which is a fake documentary. It was come, came out about 2013 or something like that. And it was a it's kind of a, um, it's actually quite a good movie, but it was a, a like a mock documentary. And the, at the end of the doc, the documentary is the story about a, guy who falls in love with a woman named Megan, but he realizes that she's a fake character. Like someone just invented her and just pretended to be this person on Facebook. And it's actually kind of an interesting, engaging story. But at the very end of the, the movie, there's like a freeze frame and it basically says, you know, Megan never existed. Something to that effect. And my DVD player, back when people used those things, DVD player froze up at one, two, three, four, five. And it was as I was typing a message to this woman, Megan, who has, who's had some, let's say some very powerful, unusual experiences. And it like, and, it, and I tried it over. I stopped the VCR and I played back again. It would freeze up over and over again at one, two, three, four, five, one hour, 23 minutes, 45 seconds. And it was Megan. Her name was right there on the screen. And I was texting just started texting with her at that second and it so like i basically was like oh my gosh is she a real person is this like some so i can't i anyway i ended up contacting her brother and like it's like it's, you know, i didn't say it outright but i was kind of like 
checking to see if like, did I, is what's going on with this? So, you know, I have contact experiences. This woman, Megan has, I'll cautiously say has some powerful experiences in her life. And I get this one, two, three, four, five synchronicity, like at the second I'm trying to reach her. So these are the things that, that are, some of these stories are so difficult to talk about because the interweaving of like subtle parts of the story, it's just to tell these stories correctly sometimes takes, it's like, it's like trying to talk about a complicated dream. You know, there's sort of dream logic built into some of these synchronicities. I think I'm going to jump in here for a minute because um, I was just thinking about something that you just did with your hands, the weaving motion that you just made with your hands. So my question for you was in relation to all of this connected directly to the numbers and the patterns and the synchronicities. Um, you've talked a lot about that, right? That, that's a very big part of how you communicate your experiences is through, um, you know, telling stories about these patterns and these ways in which things overlap in multiple ways, right? Like I, I think at one point you were talking to somebody, uh, I wish I could remember the guy's name, but you were talking to somebody who was at that time uh, reading an article about UFOs and owls that you had written. And then it was something like you happened to call him at the time that he was reading it. And then outside of his window, he saw an owl. So these sort of multiple interacting patterns of things. So my question for you is, considering that you like patterns, you follow patterns, you see meaning in them, there's a theory out there that geometric patterns in the universe, you know, the fabric of the universe or sacred geometry, whatever you want to call it, um, the geometry of energy, that it's made up of synchronicities, of these points at which we cross, you know, these sort of magical things mm -hmm. cross paths in front of us in our lives. Do you see any other patterns such as shapes or geometry in your life as well? What other patterns do you see? That's kind of what I'm curious about, because you've got the holy trifecta of the UFOs, the owls, and the synchronicities. I know that's your jam. But yes, then yes. there must be, you know, I find that it never just stays like that, right? But we, when we continue to have our experiences, they continue to unfold year after year. They keep expanding and more things come into the fray. So I'm curious to know if you see patterns anywhere else or in anything else. Well, I would say that that stuff is more of a soup than a pattern. You know, like I wouldn't be able to like plot it out like sacred geometry, but I would be able to say like, it's a, you know, it's a, like it, everything's in the soup pot getting mixed all together at a certain point. That's what it feels like to me. Um, I've certainly had, uh, I had an event where, um, do you know what the Vesica Pisces is? It's a, it's a two interacting, two interlock or, uh, circles that, and it's kind of the, um, what some people would say was the basis of sacred geometry, but I had a, a vision of a thing in my eye. I could probably bring up some visuals. It might be complicated to do it right now, but I had a, I had a, um, this is hard to explain. This is, a, this is the problem. You get into this and it's like, oh, the story gets so rich and multi-layered. I, um, in October of 2009, I laid out in the sun in a, in a park in Pasadena, California. I was visiting a friend and just traveling. And I was, I had been to Whitley Strieber's conference in Joshua Trees, but I went to Los Angeles to visit a few friends. And so I was just had some time and I was just, I just laid out in a sunny day. It was winter time for me or October. So it was nice to be in the sun. Um, I was, had been coming from Idaho and you know, how you can squint in your eyes and see and look at the sun through the, the twinkling of your eyes. I have a slight cataract in my right eye and I, I saw a caricature of myself in my own eye. This sounds so crazy trying to say this here. Let me, I think I can, I'll, I'm going to. I don't, I'm going to do the cheap, the cheapy thing. I'm going to look at them. I'm going to show you the image of it here. Sounds very MC Escher or something. MC well, it was a little, it was a little, it was pretty simple. Uh, I'm going to, it's going to take me a second to find it. Um, I'm not going to find it in that book. So just, um, forgive me. But it was a, the image itself was a, two intersecting circles and there was a, a little face in one of the circles and it was this little blank sort of bald face with kind of big eyes. It looked a little bit like a gray alien. It looked a little bit like a, like a death skull and it looked a little bit like me. So it was like this kind of blending of these things. You didn't, and I'm not, it's on my website. 
um, if you just Google, um, go to my website and, and type in um, face in my eye, um, the little face in my eye. So um, it, um, and those two intersecting circles, I had no idea, but it, several years later, someone contacted me. This person is a, an experiencer, full on experiencer. He's an, he's an abductee. I'm going to say that straight up. And he contacted me. So this is this other pattern that shows up where people who, who have the contact experiences, those are the ones that say, oh, by the way, did you know, it might not have anything to do with UFOs, but it has everything to do with the weirdness of this phenomenon. This guy contacts me and he says, that image you did of the thing in your eye is two intersecting circles. And, it, and these two circles touch at the, the diameter of both circles touch at the center of the circle next to it. And you get that um, Jesus fish shape in the in the middle, and uh, that is by many accounts like the the fundamental building block for much of sacred geometry. Uh, that's on the cover of Whitley Strieber's new book. It's called the Vesca Pisces, and his new book is about um, Jesus, and it has the Vesca Pisces right on the cover. So, like this this odd little thing where I get this little detail in my eye. The, the reason I, I, what I did is I'm an illustrator. So I just sat and squinted into the sun very gently and then drew it as best I could with a pencil illustration. And I, and I feel very strongly I captured it very well in the pencil illustration. And then I, I um, and there is a Vesica Pisces that shows up. So here's the sacred geometry that shows up in my eye. No one else can see it. It's only me and you all, no one can, you just have to sort of trust me that I actually saw it, but it, um, and this piece of sacred geometry shows up in this odd little alien face that only I can see. And there's a bunch more connected to that story to tell that story correctly. Would you, we could have to add another hour to the show. So I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. That was a great story. And also okay. I just kind of like the double meaning of only that I could see is both you and your eye. Not yes. That means yeah. a lot, but it's just kind of fun. Um, Nicole, I think might have had a question. Not sure. Nicole? She may not um, no, I didn't quite have a question just yet, but I did find the image, if we can do this. Oh, there it is. Yes. The Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's that's not the pencil sketch. That's a little one that I used Photoshop to to. It's a super eerie image, but that's the one I, I use Photoshop, and you can see the two overlapping circles in that. Um, if mm -hmm. you scroll down a little bit, there's also the pencil image right in that same blog post. So well, we're going super high tech here. We're holding the the. I know, the phone right? Up to the camera, I so. could have loaded it to share screen, but here we go. Yeah, that's a little more accurate to what I saw there, but it was, but it was, um, yeah, so there's that image. And so it was this eerie, strange image with these two overlapping circles. Beautiful. It almost has that rippling effect when you see water drops hit like concentric circles. And well, it was, it was a, it was a, you know, how when you squint into the sun, like on a sunny day on the beach and you mm -hmm. just, your eyelashes, you can get those little twinkly images that, naturally want to float in your eye like that and that's that's where that emerged and i could see it i could just squint into the a bright light and it would just pop for a, a couple of months i could see it and then it faded away wow let me ask you a question um you, you, have you got a theory of everything in terms of you've done a lot of work with synchronicities and maybe there's one that you have with the um when you're walking down and there's this things against the um the pole on the on the road Oh my word! I don't tell that one. I'm told that yeah. one. There's no UFOs in that, but it's a perfect yeah, example it, of synchronicity. I, uh, so, have you got a theory for synchronicities? Because you know that George Hansen wrote the book called mm -hmm. um, uh, Trickster, and I have the theory of wow that that they're just doing this stuff to get your attention. What's your impression? Because you've done a lot on synchronicities, on the owl, on all this kind of stuff. What the heck is going on? Why is this stuff happening? So, some people some people would argue that there's a, a researcher named um, Kirby Surprise. That's his real name, Doctor Kirby Surprise. He's a he's like I think he's a psychiatrist, and uh, but he's a doctor, and he has a he has a theory that you, the observer, like or me, I am generating them. I am putting out energy into the universe, and that energy is reflected back, and I am generating these magical events. That's actually a little hard for me to hold in my head. What? What, but he makes a pretty good argument that you can do uh, tests. You can 
do random dice toss and you can get heads more than tails if you make an intention. So in essence, you are projecting your own ideas out into the universe. The universe is reflecting those back. So my theory is that there's like a grand chess master, like with all the little pieces on the great big chess board. And, and he's like, capable of looking down into our reality we can't see out into his re reality but he can look into ours or he or they or whatever it is the collective the intelligence the angels the 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 um guardian spirits whatever what you want to use you know your totem animal they can look into our reality but we can't look out into theirs and they can just they can they have so it gets complicated right so they have to have the ability to look way off into the future and way off into the past and be just as comfortable with that so some synchronicities take a decade to fully play out. So whoever the grand chess player is, they have to be very patient or they're in some dimension of time that we're, we don't have any comprehension of. So my sense is that there's someone, some energy is messing with us for a purpose. That like these synchronicities are playing out for a purpose. Here, I'll tell you that story for the, so I'm saying it's a grand chess player, the same way you could put the chess pieces on the board and say, ooh, now that chess piece is gonna go to that square and this one's gonna go here and then they're gonna interact over there. It's, it's someone doing it with that amount of, or some energy or some intelligence doing it with that incredible forethought. I might be totally wrong, but that's how I frame it for myself. Um, so that story, so I, did, I do a lot of outdoor work and I often get really red face and some sunblocks would irritate my skin. Like I'd put sunblock on my face and my face would sting. That's kind of a normal reaction. To, to, and so I was asking people like at the school I work for was an outdoor school. Like, you know, what do you use? What's a good sunblock and everyone said oh neutrogena 45 neutrogena 45 is the best one so i did that like a bunch of people were saying everyone said the same thing neutrogena 45 so i was like went to my hometown and there's a little teeny health food store and i went in and said do you have neutrogena 45 I'm like no we don't have it. there's a little teeny drug store and i went to the little drug store and they said do you have neutrogena 45 they didn't have it so i wanted to go to the big giant grocery store it had just been built it was a total it's like a small town thing where no one really wanted this big giant grocery store, but they, you know, plowed over an old farm and put it in and everyone, and they tore down trees to put up the parking lot and everyone hated it initially. So I wasn't, I wasn't going to pull into the big grocery store. So I drove home and it was the weekend or there was the day of the week that they had the um, annual roadside cleanup. It was springtime. So I, I could see the bags lined up along the road and I help out when I can with that. So I pull into my house and I didn't even go in the house. I just went into the garage and I got some plastic bags and I figured I'm gonna do a nice thing for t the town. I'm gonna walk from my house to the stop sign on this side of the highway and pick up trash. I'm gonna cross the highway and walk back. So the house from my house to the stop sign is a half a mile and I cross the road and do it. So I'll do a full mile, right? Half a mile there, half a mile back. I'll do it, figure that was good. As soon as I start walking, it starts raining and it starts sleeting and it's that ugly wet kind of April sweat sleety snow and I was soaked and wet and cold and I'm like nope I'm gonna go all the way to the stop sign and then I'm gonna use that stop sign turn like see the stop sign and I get to the stop sign and I kid you not like the stop signs here leaning against the stop sign looking at me as I approached the stop sign was a bottle of Neutrogena 45 on the side of the road and I I have to add the fact that part of that I'm convinced part of that happened because I was doing a nice thing. Like I was doing a nice thing. I was picking up trash and that's when the synchronicity happened. If it was any other time except for, and, and now this is when I, when that happened, this was right at the dawn of when I was just barely starting to look into this stuff in my life. I looked at that little bottle and I said, I like nearly said it out loud, but the thought in my head was it's them. <laughs> And I, that really bothered me because I was like, who's them? Why did, why did I think that? So, I love that like that kind of a crossroads for maybe some people. You know, there's some people that would have looked at that and started doing numerology with the 45 or, you know, looking. I was 44 years old. I was just about to turn 45. Yeah. So that was all kind of, yeah, I did it too. Yeah. And it was at a signpost, a signpost. I mean, well, that's like, like signpost. That's like, it, that's a word, you know, like it was leaning against a signpost. So that's like, it doesn't get any. It's not subtle. It wasn't <laughs> just sunblock. It definitely wasn't just sunblock. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes I think we can go really far down the rabbit hole of whatever these things are, start doing numerology or looking up, you know, what the word Neutrogena is or looking at the shape of the bottle. Does that oh. mean something? But sometimes it's just what, what Grant says, you know, the wow factor. They're just saying, hi, we see you. Yeah. I had a psychic tell me that the, there was a woman driving down the road 
she rolled her window down in the winter and threw the bottle of sunblock out the window and said, why did I do that? <laughs> I, so I don't know if that's true or not, but I could, it's like, how did that get there? How did it get to the, like leaning against the signpost? So. <laughs> Do you follow your synchronicities? Do you use them as, as signposts in terms of? I have, I, I, so, so some people would say it's a sign on the path, on the, on the path, right? So I'm a little more like, like another fellow who's, who writes a lot about synchronicity. His name is Alan Green. Sometimes this goes by Alan Abadassa Green. Um, he said it's more like being on the open ocean in a compass, right? So if you're on the open ocean in a cloudy day, you cannot get your bearings unless you have a compass. So he treats synchronicity like a compass, right? So I'm using synchronicity like a compass. And I made a, like I, for all the, re, for reasons I could barely explain, I said, I'm going to follow this. I'm going to treat, I'm going to follow these synchronicities where they point. So yes, the signpost along the road, the, the sign, the, the compass, synchronicities have been my North Star. They have been my compass bearing for the last, it's about 2009. So that's 11 years. And your yellow line story too. I mean, that's a very vis visual representation of, I guess, what you could call signposts. You know, those, those three tags that you saw on a map in your vision, which then ended up actually occurring exactly that way in real life. Which is hard and, to explain, I know, here without visual for our audience, but that story is just amazing. If you can tell that right now, that would be great. <laughs> I know. It's hard to I'm gonna, visual, yeah. But uh, just, just having that, having those three occurrences. Okay, so I, I had slept out I under the stars that. on March 10th, 2013. I slept out under the stars. I was um, uh, coming back from a UFO conference. And while sleeping out under the stars, which is something I do, I sleep out all the time, outdoor stuff. I love it. I don't get a hotel. I was in Southern Utah. It's a beautiful, idyllic, empty spot. Um, I woke up in the middle of the night and I looked up at the hilltop and this hill next to me had a, like I looked up and I remember like thinking, that looks just like a landed flying saucer. <laughs> and I thought to myself, like, I'm like, you know, like I was pretty groovy you know like i'd been to ufo conferences and i had like get psychic hits every once in a while and i was a vegetarian and everything so i was like like oh if this was a flying saucer i would know it i would feel some intuitive knowing so i just stared at this thing for just stared at it and i was like i got nothing so it's like that's somebody's house somebody built a big house up on that hilltop um i've since been back to that site there's no house on that hilltop um and the the stuff that unfolded from that night it to tell it properly takes you know an hour and to tell it so so i got home after a 10 hours so i was that was that happened coming back from a ufo conference sleeping on the side of the road in southern utah i lived in um idaho so i drove most of the length of utah and then got into idaho and so i was at home the next day and the first thing i did was look up on on um uh, Google Maps to see if I could find that round house that was on top of that hill. There was nothing, no, nothing on the maps. I've been back to the site. There's nothing there. Um, and I, I stood by my desk and when I put, did a blog post for that, for that, um, and I did a rendering of it. I did an illustration of the, of the round structure on the hill and I posted it on my blog and unknowingly I posted it at 1234, one, two, three, four. So, uh, and I take that very seriously. That one was uh, like, someone else pointed that out to me. Like, did you know that you did that at one, two, three, four? And I'm like, so I'm standing by my desk and then whoosh, whoosh, that I could just click, click. I have this perfect vision, vivid, hyper clear, one second of three dots on a map with a yellow line connecting them. And it was obviously Southern Utah and the, westernmost line well, excuse me the westernmost push pin like a little push pin kind of thing that you would put on a on a on a on a map on google maps the westernmost one was the thing that had happened the night before and i knew it and then i had to figure out what the other two were and it took me a little while to figure it out and i make maps i do all kinds of outdoor work so making a map is not a big deal i just got right onto google maps and the simplest map program started making this map and it's easy to do any two at the other end so i have i have one at the other end where I had a profound experience of waking up inside a tent, experiencing 
total fear. And then I was floating out of the tent and I was in this white realm and it, it plays out and I had a big scratch on my chest the day after and it plays out like UFO abduction. I never saw a UFO. I got up the next morning, I'll tell you, and I walked around the tent looking for a burn mark in the grass where there would have been a flying saucer landed. There was nothing I could find. Um, but I, and then at the middle one, I had to find the middle one. And, and it was when, and I was, oh, I had this event where I, I was sleeping, listening to an owl and my friend Natasha was walking she took a walk in the middle of the night. It's beautiful, gorgeous, starry night. So she just walked around the desert that night while I was sleeping or listening to an owl. So here's this classic thing. I'm listening to an owl. There's an owl in a bush right next to my head. Natasha is walking on the Burr Trail Road, which is this rural dirt road in the southern part of Utah. And she sees a what she thinks is a flashlight on the on the in the sagebrush. And then she She's like, that doesn't make sense. It wouldn't be, who's out here? There's no one could be out here. And then it starts floating around. She realizes it's a floating orb and it starts to come at her and then it expands and goes poof. And, and it, she basically says it explodes and it scared her. And she ran back to me and, and told me and we packed up and left. It scared me too when she told me the story. So I was listening to an owl while Natasha was seeing a, what, a UFO. So there's, it's right there, owls and UFOs, same moment. Um, she was really close. She never heard the owl. Like she wasn't that far away and it was cold, clear winter, or excuse me, um, calm night in the desert. The sound carries forever. I can't understand why she never heard the owl. Now, when I, when I did the research and those three things lined up on a map, everything about my, every doubt vanished at that point. Every single doubt vanished. Like I, I had, I had spent 15 years where there was a constant kind of tape loop chugging around in my head. Like this can't happen. This stuff, all this UFO stuff you're, you feel like you've been experiencing. It can't happen. It's not real. It can't happen. It's not real. It can't happen. And I will tell you that got unplugged and never got plugged back in again after I saw those three things on the map. So I call that my confirmation event. And it was, um, it happened the day after actually, when you actually put it on the calendar, it's actually, it was two days after the sleeping out under the stars in Southern Utah. I will also add, I started the book, the first owl book that day, the day I had the experience of, of that confirmation event of not only seeing the vision in my mind's eye, but of connecting all the dots in the line and having that confirmation. When those three things lined up, like that was not random. Somehow some energy put me in those three spots. So I would purposely go back and solve the puzzle. I, and I like, so I make maps, I sleep out under the stars. So there's three different events of sleeping out. One was in a tent, but sleeping outside. Um, three different events, sleeping outside. 231 miles long, which is an anagram for one, two, three. I don't, that doesn't count as much, but it's, I did take note of that. Um, and so the three points in the map, like I'm the only one that could solve that. Like I make maps. I love making maps and, and I sleep outside. So like it was, that was orchestrated for me and for me alone to play detective on myself. And, and that, that was the moment when you just, when you confirmed that you were like an abductee because i yes, remember absolutely or i actually sent you an email and i said come on mike come on <laughs> like you're an abductee because you kept saying well i'm not sure i'm not sure i right? wasn't sure i didn't i was i got it like it's if it's someone else you know what's the easiest thing in the world it's the easiest thing in the world to be someone else and point and say well you're an abductee I, that's obvious when you try to say that about yourself that's that's like wow that is a, you're talking <laughs> yeah like i didn't want i didn't want to say it i i was totally open to saying i might be yeah, you kept saying, I, I might be, I might be. And that's what I wrote you. I said, come on already. You keep well, I, well that, it all got cemented home on that night. So, or that, or two days later after that event. And then, and then I, I kid you not, I started writing the book that day. Wow. So it, it does trigger you. It does, it, you, you believe that they are leading you or it, like, oh, let me ask you the question you always ask everybody. Are you on a mission? Yes. Thousand percent. Yeah. So, I mean, that, you know, so what's funny, cause I ask, yes, I, I do have a sense of mission. Yeah. What's your sense of mission? And people will like, I'll ask, you know, one to 10. And most people who are within this thing, they'll kind of go one to 10. They'll go, can I say 11? 
<laughs> and so I feel like that. Yeah. Like what's changed my life. Like I just get up in the morning. It's all I do is UFOs and owls. I research the stuff. I contact people. I talk to people. I write about it. I'm, you know, it's like, it's taken over. It's like obsession, yeah. obsession. And at the same time, it has been so rewarding. Like I have talked to so many wonderful people with these magical, powerful stories that, that like I, I answer emails and I just like, it's magic. People have these magical stories. Um, here, I'll tell you one that doesn't have anything to do with UFOs, but has everything to do with the power of this stuff. This guy contacts me. He's given me permission to tell the story. He's, he lives in um, New England. His family has an orchard. So it's his wife and his kids. They run this organic apple orchard. And he was in his backyard and he meditates in the orchard. So he goes in and it's right against this hillside and this hillside has a forest there. So he's, he goes out there to meditate. So he meditates and there's this horrible screeching noise, this horrible noise in the forest. It's loud. And he, he like, it makes the, you know, hair on the back of his neck stand up and he's like totally freaked out every part of his body said i gotta get out of here i gotta run away he said no i'm gonna face this so he hops the fence and he goes into the forest walks up the hill to find out where this noise is and there's this owl on a branch and it it's right low next to him it comes right up to him it's on this branch and this owl like is staring at him and squawking and squawking and like it's really angry and he he says this owl is chewing me out this owl is totally <laughs> chewing me out and then the owl flies off and he's like totally thunderstruck and he goes back to his house and he tells his wife oh my god this thing happened in the woods and this owl and this branch it was looking right at me he's looking right at me and he was squawking and yelling and chewing me out and and she says oh that's nice honey can you set the table for dinner and he tells his kids the kids had no interest at all and he's like Ugh, like give me my camera i'm going back out there and he get, takes his camera he goes into the woods he goes to the same spot and he says okay owl my wife and kids don't believe me i need a picture and this owl flies in the branch. I have the picture. It's doesn't, we're not quite as close. And it's a barred owl, which they are really loud owls. So if you're going to, so the barred owl lands in the branch and takes a picture. Now he's got this picture. And he goes back and shows his wife. And I said, after he told this whole story, I said, what were you meditating about? And he goes, I was meditating if there was a God. And I, <laughs> I was like, so there's no UFOs in this story, but that is like everything that's, to, it's like this, I mean, whether it's God or how, but just the, the, like, that's not a little question. And then to get chewed out by an owl, like you ask that question, like, rah, 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 how dare you ask that question? So you, you always go to that thing about why were you thinking about what's that all about? Where you, where you ask people the, the event oh, what were you thinking about? the big event. So what's that all about? Uh, like people, like, you know what people say a lot of times before they see a UFO? It's like, what were you thinking right before you saw a UFO? And they said, I was thinking I want to see a UFO. That's a really common. <laughs> that happened to Richard Dolan. He was like in his, I can't remember where he was. He was like in his walking his kid or something like that in a stroller. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. In a stroller. And he says, I wonder if I'll see a UFO. And he looks up and there's this thing in the sky. That's super common to have that. And I, and I ask that because, you know, oftentimes there'll be a point in the conversation and I treat owls, UFOs and synchronicity. So if you have a powerful synchronicity or if you see an owl or, you know, you'll, um, that people will, you know, I, I mean, I can, I'm paraphrasing off the top of my head and um, someone will say something like, you know, I was really terrified of this stuff for a long time. And I feel like now I can finally face my fears. And at that point, boom, there'll, there'll be a, 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 an owl. So here's a story. So one guy, um, he's actually become a pretty good friend of mine. His other name is also Mike C., uh, he's driving home from work. He was he, he was coming home. He works as a nurse, so he's driving crosses the a bridge in um, a town in Massachusetts, like an urban town. So he's like in the middle of traffic, full daylight. It's like three in the afternoon. He driving his car. He comes off the bridge and he's just about to make the turn onto um, the the highway along the river. And this owl flies right in front of his windshield, comes right at him and scares the crap out of him. This big huge owl, woof, right in his face. And then he like gets his wits together and gets about a half a mile down the road. And he looks off to the side and there's a flying saucer hovering above like this industrial park next to the river, flying saucer. Like, and he's trying to drive and he's caught in traffic and he's trying to keep his eyes on it. He's looking at this thing and it kind of raises up into the clouds. It was a cloudy day and it disappears in the clouds. And like, why didn't everyone, why didn't traffic stop? Why did it, why? So, and then he says, oh, by the way, I was listening to you. He's talking about me. I was listening to your voice giving a lecture on owls and UFOs. 
and he had put it, he had like downloaded the YouTube video audio and was listening to it on his MP3 player in his car stereo. And, and, and I was like, wait, what you, you saw an owl and a UFO while listening to my voice talking about owls and UFOs. So before earlier, uh, someone asked like, oh, you know, like you, you kind of, you know, someone was reading your book and then saw an owl and then saw you. That is so common to have somehow either my talk or people reading. I mean, it happens. I have one woman who contacted me. She's reading um, my book in bed. And then as soon as she opens it, there's an owl hoots outside and her husband's there. She kind of shows him. She says, close the book up and the owl stops. And she opens the book up and the owl starts hooting again. <laughs> she closes the book and the owl stops outside. I mean, this is like, like, like I, I, I'm almost scared to open my email in the morning because it's going to be one more story like this. And it's just people say, "Can you write? Could you write another book?" And I, I could write 500 more books. It'd be the same story over and over and over again. It's so like I'm at this point. I'm I'm. You're all out. Oh no, I I love the owl stuff, but I but I I basically would be telling the same story if I published another book. It would just be just a word or two different. You know, it's the same story with the same with the same like weird power in those stories. And what's it all about? So how do you fit it together? Your ver your role in it and what is the owls all actually about? What what's what's going on? So uh, so when I was working on the first book, Richard Dolan was he was published the first book and he was yeah. he would call me on the phone and and he'd be Mike, Mike, I love this book. I'm loving your book. And like I'm about halfway through. When do you get to the part where you explain what's going on? And I'm like <laughs> Like, uh, like, you're going to be disappointed, Rich, because I can't figure it out. And it's like, no, no, you're like, I, like, when do I get to the part where you explain, like, give me your, like, hypothesis and what it all means? I'm like, uh, well, it's not in the book. So when I did the second book, I had to kind of give my best guess what it might mean. Yeah. So, so number one is the owl's an alarm clock. Like, it is just there to say, wake up. That, that's its role. Wake up. And, you know, wake up to what is the question? You know, when I would say waking up to some higher reality. And then the next thought would be that it's, it's an, um, a marker or a totem for a, um, an initiation. And that's very common for people. You know, you know who sees owls is people who are on a shamanic apprenticeship. Like if you're going to be the shaman in the village, you're going to see owls. That is well understood within the community of people, who, the indigenous communities that still treat shamanism as something seriously. But people outside that community, like, you know, Westerners that, that take on shamanism as a, as a life path or as a role or as a duty or whatever, they will see owls. So that's, that's well understood. Um, and then um, as an archetype, so an arch so the owl is an archetype where an archetype is something that is imbued with a deeper meaning. So the owl is just a bird, right? But we can project into that this um, sense of wisdom, which comes from mythology, this sense of uh, of a messenger, which, which comes from a lot of indigenous cultures, that the owl would be a messenger between the veils. The owl can see into the night and becomes and can fly into the night that very quickly turns into a metaphor for flying into other realms and in, in, in societies and cultures all over the globe have that as their core mythology around the owl. What, what about the weirdness? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, wait, so I'm waiting for someone, just jump in if you got a question because I, mm -hmm. I, you're just initiating numerous questions. What, why the bizarreness? Because I, I talk about the theory of wow, why do UFOs have lights on them so you can see them? Why, why do they make zigzags in the, you know, a zigzag in the sky? Because they know everybody's going to go freak out. And they're going to, so you talk a lot about, and you actually go on stage with your owl and you have the four foot owl, which it's makes no sense there. whatsoever. Yeah. And I gave you, I don't know if you talked to Chris uh, Peters, Barbara Streisand's stepson, where he has the five foot owl. Because I remember when he told me he had the one in the bathroom and, he, and his wife saw it. And then she calls him in and he comes in and he says, it's a five foot. And I said, you sure it was five feet? You sure it wasn't four feet? No, it was five feet. And it was sort of like, so what's the deal with the weirdness of, of the owl? Because you, you actually go on stage and you show people because people don't really realize it. They just say, oh, there's this owl, this four foot owl standing in the middle of the road. And it doesn't make any sense. People don't realize this is really, really weird. This, this And you actually go on stage with a four foot owl and show people what it actually looks like. And, well, and, I, and, I, and I have, so I have a 27 inch owl, which I kind of is this 27 inches is, that's a big bird, right? 27 inches is, you know, and so that's about as big as any owl is going to get. 
So if someone said, I saw an owl is about 27 inches, I'd say, okay, I give you that. I'll let you, I'll let you have that one. And, and so I put a little, it's, it's pretty tiny. And, and, um, but so the four foot tall owl, the implication is that is a screen memory. So people are seeing something that is, um, I mean, I have the number of people I have that I was driving down the road at night and I came up to this, I could turn a corner, there's a four foot tall owl in the center of the road. And, and Dolores Cannon has this story when she was, so, so here's, so, so Dolores Cannon has a story. She sees a four foot tall owl on the side of the road and she writes about it in her book, The Custodians. And she pulls up to it and it, and it flies a little further down the road and she pulls up to it and it flies further down the road. She's, she's driving a big truck in Arkansas and the owl can look over the hood of the truck. I mean, you, 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 the smallest car in the world and the biggest owl in the world, they ain't going to be able to look over the, the, the hood. So that's like, that's just plainly impossible, but that's what she saw. And like, I don't have to ask her cause she said it. Like if I, like she's not around anymore, so I can't ask her, but in the book, she talks about it. So if I had asked her what was going on in your life right before the sighting in the, her telling of that she said that was the night i sat around with a bunch of co-workers at the at the clinic a bunch of therapists and she she's basically said you know i'm getting all this ufo stuff that's showing up in my research like i gotta decide whether i follow it like do i ignore it and dismiss it and move on and do something else and just do the safe thing with my therapeutic work for people like stopping smoking and just family issues and stuff like that or do i follow this ufo thing that, that she asked that question that night of herself. And that was the night she saw the owl. So you guess, why do I ask this question? Because you get this weird stuff like that. So why is it weird? I think that it's weird because now I'm going to, I'm probably wrong, but this is how I frame it in my mind. So the, so the grand chess master that's putting all these things, they're in that timeless realm where they can see infinity in this direction and see backwards and time and forwards. And they can, they have, they can see and anything that someone from that other realm does is going to seem weird to us. So I'm thinking that they're, that they, it's weird because it, it can't help but being weird because it's being generated from outside the boundaries of our physical reality. If that makes sense. Like you bring in something from like you bring in something, I'm in Michigan, you bring something from Ohio and it's not going to be weird, right? You, if I'm in this 3D earth plane and something from a six dimensional cosmic realm enters my space, it's going to be weird. It's going to have a weird vibe to it. So oftentimes people will be in their yard and they'll just say, everything got deathly quiet. It got so weird. The strangest yeah. thing that's ever happened to me. And a UFO will fly over. Like just the reality itself feels weird when people are in the midst of this. And then you'll remember it because you have a weird story I'll get to in a second. But the one I always bring up uh, that I've sort of uh, um, mentioned now was um, Betty and Barney Hill. Barney describes the, the beings have hats on. And so I always say, like, what do you got, a baseball team on Zeta Reticuli? Or I ask Chris Bledsoe, did you see the shadow people with the hat? Well, I saw that guy. Like, what's a shadow person need a hat for? And it's this weird sort of angle that people really don't sort of question. Or the other thing, and you had this example where you wake up in the middle of the night, the, the alien is going, Mike, Mike, wake up, wake up, wake up. And then it wakes you up, gets your attention, and then boop, puts you out to sleep, like the way you described it. When you saw the beings, you can tell the story. What do you do? This bizarre thing that people describe, you pulled the covers over your head and went to sleep. And oh. people describe this all the time. And that's the whole thing. It's like, it's why does the alien wake you up just to knock you out again? It, it, and it's like they want you. They want you to know. They want. It's like the fear thing gets in there, and then you, and yet you immediately go to sleep. And it's this weird thing that this story will never leave your mind. It's this. It just sort of. And I think it was one of the stories that haunted you through your life. This story of of these beings coming to you on that night. Well, so what happened was I I was lying in bed and I sat up and like a bright light was coming through the window. I worked with Bud Hopkins on this when he was still alive and and talked about this. So I'm I'm lying in bed. It's a bright light coming in the window. And I sit up and I look out the window. I wake up and sit up and look out the window. And there are five gray beings walking towards the house. I'm the only one in the house. It's on this lonely country road in Maine. I was living in Maine at the time. And they're walking in the snow and there's this big bright light behind them. And it would be great if the bright light was the size of a flying saucer. It was about the size of a washing machine or a refrigerator. It was kind of a small light. And, and they were walking towards the house. Now that's like scary. That's a scary image. I felt nothing. I felt nothing at all. And I heard this voice in my head that says, now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down. <laughs> and I went, oh, and I sat down. And so Bud Hopkins said, 
how often do you get woken up by a light? I'm like, I never know. It's got to be a noise or something. Was it's like, and so, like, and that that um, night had this that moment had that weird silent quality to it. It had this weird clarity to it. It was like everything was hyper vivid. Everything was crystal clear. It was almost like um, it, it was it was dreamlike, but it wasn't a dream. There was a, and I've asked, and I've had that feeling several times in my life, and I'm I'm very aware of what it is. I met a woman. She had a close-up UFO sighting while driving a car in Los Angeles, in a convertible, and and it's a pretty strange story. It sure sounds like a contact event, an abduction event, but she was driving. Now, in city traffic, and right in the middle of Los Angeles at rush hour, she says, "You know when you take two magnets and you push them, try to push them together, and they go click." And then turn one and turn it halfway and then try to push it again and, and it won't connect. It's kind of, it's got this warbly sort of energy, kind of like, you, there's nothing to see. There's nothing to see between the magnets, but you can't push them together. And there's this, this palpable, weird, warbling energy there. And she said that, you know what it's like being in the presence of the UFO? It's like being in between those two magnets. And when she said that, I was like, you, you know, you know, that was the best description I've ever heard for like trying to describe that weird silence. <clears throat> I can't remember what your question was, but I, I, you know, so I get on a roll sometimes. And... No, no, it was just this weird, this weird aspect that the, if you, if you had this sort of scary event, the last thing you're going to do is pull the covers over your head and go to sleep, which I've heard this so many times, this oh, yeah. weird thing where people just like if you're panicked you're not going to go to sleep but they just go to sleep and they instantly go to sleep as if this is part or why does the alien actually wake you up like well what's if you i mean if they're going to grab your sperm or do whatever they're going to do they don't have to wake you up it's yeah. like they're waking up for a reason it's like and, and there's always this fear aspect which is almost like a transition where they break you into the other realm it's this forcing you to dissociate and as soon as you've dissociated then it's like okay go back to sleep now we're, we've got you and and they take you off like why do they what, what's your interpretation of why they do this weird thing where they're sort of like coming to people waking them up and then and then doing whatever they're going to do but knocking out again so a lot of people don't get woken up i'm convinced that a lot of people people are having these experiences a lot and then it's yeah. happening seamlessly so yeah. one thought is like their their little methodologies just mess up Right there, oops, like we didn't turn the knob quite right to make sure they stayed asleep um, or their magic wand or whatever. So that, um, you know, very common for like one the spouse to try to wake up the other, you know, the husband tries to wake up the wife and the, like the wife is totally asleep and won't wake up, but why am I awake? It, maybe for the exact same reason that the UFOs have lights so they get seen so that people have this marker in their lives um, that they know this. Joe Montaldo, who's a researcher out of um, New Orleans, he says that the owls show up as markers so that they know something weird has happened. So if you see a four foot tall owl on the road, you're gonna always say like, that just doesn't seem right. And someday you're gonna look into it. Like it's there on purpose, like a bookmark in a book. Yeah, uh, you, you probably, talk, have you talked to uh, Candace Powers about the giant rabbit? I, every time I talk to her, I say, Candace, tell the story about the giant rabbit. She, it's exactly the same story, except it was a giant rabbit. In the, on the road and it would move a couple of feet and then she'd drive, move a couple of feet and drive. And then she told this whole story. It took like an hour to get home to a farmhouse about a mile and a half. Oh, this is, that's, her. that's Dolores Cannon's story. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then she, and then she told her boyfriend, she said, Candace, I think you need to be regressed. And that's when she got Bud Hopkins to regress her. And of course there was no rabbit in the middle of the road. It was, of course she was being taken. And it's this screen image thing. You, you talked about um, um, birds, you talked about the owl, but you also know, can you talk a little bit about the hummingbirds? Because um, like I think it's um, Colin, Colin Andrews has hummingbirds, Chris Bletso has hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. So are, there, are they using these other sort of... Well, so those, that's, 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 uh, that's nothing new. That's like, if we were to talk to a shaman, right? So get someone from the, the Indian reservation in South Dakota, they'd sit down with us and you say, you know, like, oh, people are having these owl experiences and other people are having hummingbird experiences. He'd be like, that's like old hat. That's like part of our culture. Like, like the owl has a totem message. Hummingbirds are very light, delicate things. So, um, 
So that, so that all I know is that Colin Andrews, I asked the reason I basically said, oh, he's Colin Andrews got to have an owl story. So I asked him, he said, no, I don't have any owl story, but I've got lots of hummingbird stories. He never actually told me any of the hummingbird stories, but, but um, so birds, that's very common. So, so here, this one woman, I'm going to um, have to change a couple of things here because, because I'm sure she'd be fine with me telling this. So um, her mother died. And there was a, there was a hawk that would hang around the house. She'd pull into the hawk would be like, a, like meet greeting the car. So hawk would be at the top of her, yeah. of her garage. I mean, and she contacted me and she said, um, like this hawk is showing up. Like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to know what to do? Here's what you do. Okay. Well, next time you see the hawk, ask it, what are you doing? I just said that just like, I had to say something. So I said, ask it, why are you here? What's what? And then the, she comes home the next day that the hawk is on top of the um uh on top of the garage and she's st stacked she walks up to the hawk and says like i respectfully ask why are you here what what are you asking for why are you here what message are you trying to give me and now the hawk looks at her and flies off and she walks in the house and the phone rings and there's no one there and she's got one of those call things where she knows where the call came from and it was this unlisted number from Francine, Massachusetts. She's a private detective and she looks up some stuff and there's no such place as Francine, Massachusetts. It's no town. There's like a, and she did some more work and there was like an old exchange back when it was dial rotor up numbers that was called Francine. It was just a place where the phone company had an exchange. Her mother's name was Francine. So wow. this is, I, this is every day I get a story like this of that power. It's impressive. How many stories do you have? Uh, how many <laughs> owl stories would you have in your collection now? So I have a file that has about a thousand in them. And then that's the good ones. That's like the A plus stories. So I've got a, easily a thousand A plus stories. That doesn't count the ones that I'm like, people tell me and the ones that I kind of keep in my head and stuff like that. So it's like, it's a, it's a full-time job just to keep up with this. And it's a wonderful job. You know, in the sense that I'm honored to be doing this because it's remarkable. People ask me, you know, like, how's your life changed since taking on this owl stuff and this UFO stuff? And I and I remember the first time someone asked me that, I thought for a second, I said, I now live in a magical universe. Yeah. <laughs> that brings me to a quick question. Um, on your website, you have one of my favorite Nietzsche quotes about staring when you stare into the abyss the abyss also stares into you. And so my question to you after your years of research and diving into this abyss of owls and synchronicities, what have you learned about yourself on that inward journey as you're exploring the outer depths of this high strangeness? Um, a lot of stuff fell away. Like a lot of stuff that I cared about before just fell away like like i'm content driving an old car like a, I, I had to be like a lot of stuff just like yeah. crumbled and vanished <clears throat> i um i so i have i suffered terribly from clinical depression mm -hmm. from the age 12 until i was 52 and part of this research. So I, I, I no longer suffer from depression. i have no symptoms, knock wood, but I, I feel like I'm symptom free. And I, I feel it's tied into this, like a, just this, just being open enough to, to look into this. And, and um, like, I was a tense person before I started looking into this stuff. Like I was like, and there was a point when actually going through like my life, I was I still can get kind of amped up at times, but I was, I'm a much calmer person now. So mm -hmm. that going through the inner journey of, and I, I, so that first book was therapy. That was five years of writing and, and five years of internal therapy. Part of that was when I was working on the blog too, which some of those stories came from the blog. So that was, that was therapy. Wow. Thank you. That's wonderful. I hear that often. You hear people find a sense of gratitude or 
they notice the materialistic things become meaningless. And yeah, this sense of oneness, I think is how a lot of people describe it. You feel at one with your fellow humans and everything. So well, it's still a struggle. Sometimes I don't feel one with my fellow humans, but I mean, I know it's there, <laughs> you know, like I know I can, right. if I like, you know, I know it's in me to feel that and I felt <laughs> it before. So, um, so it's not easy. It's not like it's an easy journey, right. but it is definitely a rewarding journey. Mm -hmm. I, I come, oh, go ahead, Sinead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say, I, the, the further I dive in to the phenomenon and personally look at myself, and Sinead, I, I think you've spoken on this before, just like waves of gratitude when you have those uh, synchronicities that are affirmations and yeah, and that's that's why I love this topic. It does kind of merge that spiritual self with the great beyond. So that's why I'm in it. <laughs> well, the, I've I've often said that like like a thoughtful like two people, two thoughtful people sitting down over a cup of coffee talking about UFOs, they should very quickly. Yeah, there you go. I was like, <laughs> they should very quickly get to why am I here? What does it all mean? You know is there a God? Like they should, they should take them right to the biggest questions. Mm -hmm. And so that's my sense. It does. You need know, to talk about the weather. You don't go there, you know, right. um, but you talk about UFOs. If you're thoughtful, you're going to somehow, it won't, it'll take five minutes and you should be like struggling with like, what does it all mean? Why are we well, here? What's I'll the purpose jump of in here Before Sinead asked the question, and I always tell people that's, a, that's kind of a joke that I don't know if Sinead or Nicole have been to any conferences, but you, that you're describing exactly what happens at conference. Like your relatives and friends will think, Oh, they're there and they're showing UFO photographs and they're talking, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, no, it's all within five minutes. It's like, is there a God? Like, why are we here? I mean, it's that, that <laughs> conversation goes there every time. And it's so weird. It's never about UFOs when you're, when you're in a, in a thing like that, it moves to these sort of uh, bigger questions almost instantly. You're right. You might have the first five minutes of a conversation or two minutes of a uh, conversation yeah. might be about UFOs. And then immediately is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Sinead, I, I have been to conferences and, and you're so right, Grant. I mean, that's how I knew it was my tribe, right? Like within 10, 15 minutes of walking in, I could just tell these people are my, I'm not on my own floating around in this anymore, wondering what the heck is happening to me? Why has this always been happening to me? Why does nobody else, like, why can't I talk to anybody else about this? You know, so it really is quite a, a, a happy making experience as Nicole was alluding to that once you, well, you know, once you, once you get cracked open and these things start to happen, it, it's a, it's an amazing, wonderful, magical experience that does create all of these emotions. So I want to go back to um, kind of jumping off what Nicole was saying. I think we were kind of reading each other's minds a little bit there because <laughs> uh, she asked very close to what I wanted to ask you. Going back to your, um, your stories, all the stories that you have, not of your own necessarily, but all the stories you have from so many of the people that you've met and collected stories from over the years, you know, that you could write 500 books about it, there are that many. Um, and touching on what Nicole was bringing up about how these experiences affect our lives, how they change us, not just internally, but also how they actually change externally our lives as well. Many things about our lives just become different naturally, automatically, as a result of this change we feel inside. Have you kept up with the people that you've collected these stories from? Like, do you follow up with them? And so that's my, that's part A of my question. Do you follow up with them? Part B is, and then, you know, what's that like, you know, part A, what, what is that like when you follow up with them? Do they tell you more or uh, are their experiences often the, the one and only experience they have? And then B, part B of my question is, um, how does it affect their lives? Like how many of these people do you find are really struck by this crazy experience they have, but then it becomes that crazy thing that happened to me 15 years ago and they just never stop thinking or talking about it. And how many of them have this crazy experience and then more and more keeps happening and it keeps unfolding. Like they, they are, they dive in, you know, they open the door and walk through it and it becomes a part of their life as opposed to people who maybe just have the one experience or have one experience and then are not sure that they want more and maybe keep the door closed because they're not sure if they want more of that. Do you, do you encounter both? What do you, oh, what are, do you uh, find? So I'm, gonna, I'm encountering all of that. Yeah. So to some degree, like some people are, have a very traumatic experience and they frame it as trauma, which they can be They're Dark, scary stuff happens. And so I don't want to, I don't want to be the person that 
says, oh no, you're misinterpreting it. It's all love and light, you know, because I that's like that's their experience. It's not up to me to tell someone else what they've experienced. Um, I've had people do that to me and I didn't like it, you know, like sort of like I'll tell my story and they'll say, well, here's what really happened. And I'm like, so like I don't I can't do that. So but what so as far as oftentimes what happens is people will um a lot of people reaching out to me are in a place of like they're shook up. They're struggling with their experiences. And and I'll, they'll, you know, like I'll, a couple of experiences in the book that I've got back to people in years later. Oftentimes, you know what happens? I'll be in the town where they they live and I'll be like, oh, that guy lives in, oh, let me just, I'll, I'll, you know, so I'm like, I'm going to be in the, I'll be in uh, New York City, you know, wherever it might be. I'll be in New York City for, you know, a few days at the end of the month. Like we should get together. And so we get together and have coffee. And, and if it's been a few years, what I hear very cons consistently, like they were totally confused and shook up initially and like doubted everything. And they'll say, well, this other stuff happened. And now I'm, now I'm, I recognize that it's a real thing and I'm, and it's been confirmed for me that it's a real thing. And then, um, and then another thing. So one thing that also happens is that people have like a surface set of stories that like makes sense. Like, here's the story. Like I saw a UFO and it was this weird thing. I was driving and I saw the UFO it was very clear. And then, you know, and then you'll talk with them more, talk with them a year later and they'll say, well, this other stuff happened. And then they will tell you the weirdest stuff, the weirdest, strangest stuff that, that they were ashamed or intimidated or embarrassed to say the first time. Cause it just, the weird stuff doesn't make any sense. Seeing a flying saucer out of there, you know, while driving is one thing. And, you know, and then seeing an owl when they got home, that's, that's one person's story. And then, but the, um, the really weird stuff is, 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 is woven into this. And oftentimes you won't hear that the first time you talk to someone, you have to, you know, talk with them hour and hour. You have, really have to dedicate some time because they're not going to share it unless you're ready to de dedicate that time. Um, and then, so the other part of the question was, so my answer was like, Oh, like I'm getting all of the things. Lives? Like, how does it change their, their lives, their perspectives? You know, what is it? What do you hear from these people as to like, after the initial shock subsides and they start integrating the experience, how does it change who they are? How does it change maybe other people around them or circumstances of their lives or even their life trajectory? I mean, I've heard stories about people who have completely changed their path, you know, something will happen to them, even just one occasion, one, one event that impacts them. And they might be on a career path and that completely changes. Mm -hmm. or they're going to make a move and then they decide to go to move somewhere else. So what do you see in terms of the impact internally and externally on these people? Well, to try to sum it up in generalization would be tough because it's all over the map. So all of those things you just said, I'm, I'm hearing, you're, you're confirming everything that shows up in, in the people I talk with and, and the people within this research and, and the people who come to me with their owl stories, that they have a powerful transformative event. So, and, and it, the level of being transformed is subtle. You know, so, you know, what's very common is people volunteer at the, like the animal shelter. That's really common. Like, oh, you know, like, like I started volunteering. So that's like, the, um, that's a nice altruistic, benevolent, wonderful thing to do, to volunteer at the animal shelter. And then other people were like, oh, I quit my job and I became a psychic. You know, <laughs> and like, I get, I've heard that one a lot. Um, like all of a sudden I was flooded with this psychic stuff and now I'm a working psychic and I'm helping people. And, and, and I, you know, oftentimes people would say, you know, like I do some of the work for pay and some of the work I do for, you know, for free so I can help people. Um, they'll have a transformative event uh, Lots of divorces where a spouse will change and the and the you know the the wife will change and the husband will stay the same. You know, the wife will have a powerful transformative experience, whether it's through, you know, I kind of lump all this stuff together, a mystical experience of a UFO contact or a mystical experience of an owl contact or a powerful mystical synchronicity. It's enough to change someone's life. And they'll, you know, their partner won't change. They'll stay the same. And so they'll they'll grow apart. Yeah, that's very common too. <clears throat> I'll interject a little bit and I have a question. Um, do you have any stories of multiple owls as opposed to just the one? Is there, like myself, I get visited by owls 
and occasionally I hear one, but it's usually, I call it, it's the families here. Mm -hmm. And like at certain periods of time of day, like, and it, it will be synchronistic. Like I get five, five, five. I'm like, oh, it's 5.55, woo time's on. <laughs> Well, more often than not, there's owls and it'll start off as one and then it's like four more will answer them. Or I'm, I'm a night owl. I s often stay up till 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. And from what I think I know about owls, that's an unusual time for them. Maybe dawn as the uh, sun is coming up or when the sun sets, that might be where they talk a lot. But in the dead of the night, like right before I fall asleep, it's like kind of like Grant says, it's like, why do you wake me up to put me to sleep? Mm -hmm. It's like I'll be dozing off and then I hear all the owls and I always think now I can sleep and then I'm out. So um, so you ask, so people see, yeah, like right. it's not uncommon for people to see lots of owls. Like I, I was, um, I mean, I saw... I, one summer, the summer of autumn of 2009, I was seeing owls all the time, mm -hmm. like multiple owls. I was hiking with a friend. We saw, we, uh, we were doing an altruistic thing. We were camping mm -hmm. and him. So there was, we were camped by this pond. The pond was really murky and green. And I had been in the same spot before. And, you know, like everyone's like, oh, this water's gross. We have to drink this water. And I'm like, give, give me all your water bottles. Me and, me and Peter will, this guy, Peter, well, I'll, we'll all go hike and, 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 fill up the water bottles. I've been here before, just about a half mile up the trail is a spring. We'll fill all the water bottles out of the spring and then we'll come back with our full water bottles. And we did. And we handed the water bottles out. And then <clears throat> when we got back, so on that walk there and on the walk back, we were having the most mystical, spiritual conversation about UFOs and about synchronicity. This guy is a working, he's a psychiatrist and he's really open to this stuff. And so he was, he was great to talk to. And I was like, that that was a chapter of my life when I was pretty shaky. And so he was wonderful to talk with. And <clears throat> we, we get back to camp and we, that altruistic thing, like cleaning up the trash on the side of the road. We're doing a nice thing. We lay down, which I've something I've never done before. It's a beautiful sun is setting. We laid right down in this field, right on our backs and looked at the sky. Both of us, we didn't have to say, we didn't decide to do it. We both just laid down. As soon as we laid down, these five owls came out of the trees and swooped right above us as mm -hmm. we're laying on our backs. We laid down first. The owls came out after we laid down. <clears throat> and he's a psychiatrist and the owls flew away. And we were both like, oh my God, that was the coolest thing. Five owls, big owls flying right above our faces. And, and he said, what were we talking about? Or I asked him, what were we talking about right beforehand? And I said, you were talking about your mother. He said that to me, you were talking about your mom. And I was like, I was? He's like, yep. You were talking about your mom right before the owls showed up. Now, my mom had been suffering terribly from Alzheimer's at that point. And I woke up that I had a dream that night. And it was nothing in the dream except my mom's face. And she was crying and she seemed sad. And the next morning I was like, I had to get, we had cell phones, but you can't get service in these mountains. You have to be on a peak. So I, with the team, we got to this crest and I pulled out the phone and I called my mom and she was fine. And it's hard to, she, she was, she would just, she was in the throes of Alzheimer's. So we asked her anything. She would say, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. But that's, there's no UFOs in that story, but it has that, that that's, a, that's, a, that's an emotional story for me to tell. Mm -hmm. And that those owls played a role in that, in that complex emotional story with Peter and I having a conversation of sort of a spiritual conversation about UFOs and it culminating with me like, with needing to call my mom. Mm -hmm. Didn't you have an owl experience where you got them twice? You were with a girl or something, and the oh yeah, that that was that and, one. And you came back and they, they were again again the second time. So I camped with this woman. Her name is Kristen, and this is another thing. This this that I keep an eye out for is um, people with the name Christ in their name, Christopher Bledsoe, Christopher Bledsoe Jr. There's like the number of people who contact me named Chris is. It's, it's settled down a little bit lately, but man, there was a point when it felt like I couldn't, like every email that came in, it felt like they were named Chris um, or Kristen or Christina or Chris or Christian. So there's that Christ name showing up. So um, her name is Kristen and we, I met her like total stranger. 
I, this is usually, I start my talks with this story and there's, this is one of the, one more of these stories, which is layer upon layer upon layer. Um, and I just talked to her recently. We, we texted, I hadn't talked to her in years and we just texted and I asked her something, I'll, I'll get to it at the end. Um, she, I basically said, let's go camping, total stranger. Let's go camping. So we went camping for one night and these owls showed up and they showed up right at sunset and it was right as I was cooking dinner and it was right as she was saying something that I thought was so profound, like this total stranger. And I'm like, wow, this is a really profound story. Like I, this, I didn't expect her to have this, like I was impressed. There was this depth and this power to what she was sharing. And then these owls showed up. And then four days later, we went camping again. Same thing, the owls, so that was three owls showed up that first time. The second time, three owls showed up again. And I was, um, like the first time they showed up, we were camping in a totally different spot for just one night again. Um, and these three owls showed up. The first time that it happened, they were kind of be off in a tree, off in the distance, or they'd kind of swoop kind of high above our heads. This next time, they were landing on the branch right next to us. And that's one owl like landed at our feet. And both Kristen and I were just like gobsmacked. Like, how is this possible? Um, I had been reading a lot of UFO literature at that time. And I knew that the owls were a screen memory. So I, in the moment, was like looking at this owl, trying to figure out, is this a real owl? It looks like a real owl. I'm pretty sure it's a real owl. I think that's a real owl. And I, I, in essence, heard a voice in my head that very clearly said, I was looking at a real owl. And a voice in my head said, this has something to do with the UFOs. You are an abductee. So that's this message. Like the title of the book is this, The Messengers. The message could not have been more clear. Two nights in a row. So this woman, Kristen... And I both started looking up totem animals and what's the meaning of, of owls and such. Um, I asked her later, months later, what were we talking about that first night when we saw the first owls? I remember you were talking about something interesting and I, and I took note of it. What were we talking about? She said, oh, I remember exactly what I was talking about. I was talking about my deepest, most heartfelt feelings of what God means to me. So there's one more example of that. I talked to her just about a week ago, just over... Facebook chat. And I kind of said, listen, I got to ask, what, what do you, did, did it feel orchestrated, those owls? Did it like feel orchestrated? And she was like, what do you mean by orchestrated? Like, I'm like, well, orchestrated. And she said, well, I mean, shortly after the owls were there, like I left town and I found the single most important book of my life. And I think it saved my life. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's what I mean by, <laughs> like, that's exactly the, what I, so you know, what was happening in your life leading up to the event, what happened after? She basically said, well, just shortly after that, like, I found the book that I feel saved my life. So. This changed your artwork at all? I mean, obviously, you're going to draw different things, you know, because of your experiences. But I mean, the actual experience of creating your art, or maybe the creative process, has it changed for you at all since you started having all of these synchronicities, everything you've been talking about and writing about? You know, I don't think it's changed it at all. I mean, my, my illustration style and my drawing style is constantly morphing and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's all, I can kind of look at a drawing I did 15 years ago and like just by, oh, the scratchy lines and stuff, that's 15 years ago. And then, oh, that's 20 years ago. And, you know, I can, you know, that's last week. I, I can totally just tell by the way that like the pen moves on the page. Um, but no, I don't think it, I don't think it's impacted that at all. You know, what it has given me, it's given me permission in a way to sort of say, like, I'm an artist. Like I always was kind of, like I would always call myself an illustrator because I worked for doing illustrations for ad agencies and books and magazine articles and stuff like that. That's different than being an artist. And and I will say that like the, the, mystis, the mystical quality of these things have allowed me to just say like, I'm an artist, I can say it now, you know, which I wouldn't have been able to say that comfortably 10 years ago. I kind of knew it, but I wouldn't say it aloud. It just felt presumptuous. You ever thought about doing a children's book? Yep. I started it a couple of years ago and I've kind of, I've got my plates full. So, you know, and I haven't done anything. So, but I have thought about it. 
I think children would obviously be very receptive to stories about owls that are illustrated so beautifully like that. Yeah. So do we have time for another story here? Sure. Yeah. So this guy, Ben, Ben is the fellow who said that was a vescopisis in your eye, that thing in your eye, the two circles. That was the guy who told me that story. So he says, Oh, I've got some stories. And so he had a story. He's, he's telling his, his, he's driving his kids. They're little. He's driving them home from a roller skating birthday party. And they're all in the car. So he's got all the kids they are in the van and he's driving home and they're like, tell us a story, tell us a story. So he's got all the kids in the car and he's like, I'll tell a story. He tells them his, his like his UFO stories. And he framed them a little bit like, like uh, campfire stories. He had never told anyone, like he never told his family. So here's this car full of like 11 year olds. He's telling these stories. And I'm like, wow, what a cool story. And he finishes, he has a missing time story. And it's kind of a spooky campfire story the way he tells it. And at the very end of the missing time story, he's driving along and an owl flies right in front of the car, just as he finishes telling the final story. So later, this is not the, his kids. He's got a couple kids and they're like, dad, dad, like read us a bedtime story. Totally different thing. Earlier that day, sorry, I got to this is the problem with telling these, to tell these properly. There's so many layers to it. Earlier in the day, they went hiking, him and his kids, and they would hike down the trail and this owl would be on a branch and they would walk past the owl. And then the owl would fly along the trail and pass them and land on a branch. And then they would walk down the trail and they, and they would pass the same owl and the owl would fly and they'd see it fly from branch to branch. So the owl followed them on this hike. And the kids thought it was the greatest, coolest thing ever. And the dad, Ben was kind of like, he was kind of unsettled. He was scary for him. So they get home and it's that same night and they, they, um, uh, everyone says, um, all the kids say, read us a story and it's great, pick a book. And so there's this book called Say Boo. It's about a ghost named Ben. The ghost is named Ben. So it's this ghost. And I actually, it's funny because I got to footnote this in the book, this, because I could footnote a little kid's book. Um, and so the owl, excuse me, so the, the ghost is getting ready for Halloween and he has to scare people by saying boo, but he keeps on forgetting. So he goes up to the cow and he wants to scare, scare the cow and he says moo, you know, and, and then he, so he can't scare the, 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 the cow. And, um, and so the, it's setting it up so he can say who to the owl, right? But so the line in the book that he's reading, Ben reads the line and then Ben looked up and saw a big, owl in a pine tree and right at that moment the dog starts barking downstairs going crazy he had just read that line and so he runs downstairs and opens the door the dog's barking at the door and like what's going on and so he looks outside there's nothing and he looks up at the big pine tree in his yard and there's an owl staring down at him the last words he spoke were and then ben looked up in the big pine tree and saw an owl when to do this like to write these stories, I go back and forth and I send everything to the person, the witness, the person. It's not my story. It's their story. I'm like, I'm not signing off until you are absolutely going to give me the okay that this is how it happened. So Ben and I, Ben was great. Ben was super easy to work with. And he was like, oh, this happened a little bit more like this. And let's change this line here. And I, that kind of feedback on that. So as we're doing this, he says, this is the same story. These two stories, the same story. I was in the car trying to find my voice, telling my kids this is part of my reality. I was telling my family about myself. I was finding, I had my own voice to tell my family. And then the, uh, the, the ghost, Ben, Ben the ghost, was trying to find his voice. He couldn't say boo. He would say who or moo. And in the book ends where he finds his voice, he said, this is the same story. So this is, this is what floats my boat these stories that have such a like on the surface they're one story you dig a half a layer deeper there's another story you go way down deep and there's a there's this mystical story there mm -hmm. i've uh sometimes heard to this as this entire process of you know denying the experience diving into it having your awakening um, I've recently heard it referred to as closing your loop. And uh, I think it's Alan Stiebelman, I think is how you say his last yeah. name, um, is where I first heard the term coined. And 
he noted in his work and he also collaborated with Jacques Vallée for one of his films. And uh, they noted that after you close your loop, some experiencers are given a name or receive a name. Have you come across any information like that? Or have you received a name? Like, for instance, after my um, second big sighting, which kind of affirmed so much for me, and Grant, I don't know if you remember, this was kind of a little synchronicity. You and I happened to be talking about the Avery and I kept teasing like, oh, what would my bird name be? <laughs> well, I went through a sighting and I got a message of oneness and I was told to read a poem out loud for everyone and a second poem for just myself. And the second poem, the first line is, you are called Snowbird, or your name is now Snowbird. <laughs> and I just wondered if you had come across any data like that or any mystical happenings with being given a new name. I've got something in more of a shamanic context I have, mm -hmm. where people will, there's a woman, um, Denise Lynn, um, who saw a close-up UFO mm -hmm. and years later started doing spiritual work or actually was doing spiritual work at the time and she's now um she writes a lot of books she's um writes books on spirituality and and um totem animals and and she's a wonderful like big-hearted radiant person and she has a story of of going into the woods to find her spirit name mm -hmm. and uh we like meditated closed her eyes and meditated. And basically the intention was to find her spirit name. And then the, the forest got totally quiet. All the same thing, that weird silence. That's a UFO, that's a UFO thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that weird silence, but this was no. And then she opened her eyes and she was sitting on the forest floor and then on the branch right in front of her was a big horn, great horned owl staring at her. So um, I can't remember the name she, felt she was given but i think she was white feather was what she said because the owl left some white feathers um and i've also heard um there's a story in the book of a woman who took mushrooms her name is shauna home and she was a shamanic ceremony this is again in shamanic context mm -hmm. um she was she had always been with a mentor when she had taken the mushrooms and she took mushrooms and she's also seen a ufo it's it's like this thing where it's like like is she an abductee is she had contact it's like very murky to say but these stories that emerge play out with the profound power of the kind of stories that people with these contact experiences will have so she took a bunch of mushrooms and all of a sudden she's in her bedroom and the whole interior of the bedroom is like covered in these white feathers and it's this trippy thing and this huge like owl comes up to her and says um, you are no longer daughter who yearns. You are now daughter who knows. Mm -hmm. And she felt she was being taken from the three stages of womanhood, from the maiden, the mother, and the crone. And mm -hmm. she felt she was making the transition from mother to crone in that point, you know, or wise woman. And um, so she was basically felt she was being renamed daughter who knows. And that was very formal. This is, there's no, there's no flying saucers. There's no UFOs in the story, but it feels like the kind of thing that plays out in this context. I get that people like Amazon kind of thing was, you know, like people will review the book, like this book is crazy. This guy, he's like taking people seriously who take, take mushrooms and like that data should be thrown out and not used at all. I'm like, that's the best stuff in the, that's like the most powerful mystic. It's the people being on board a UFO is like this mystical experience for people. When people talk about it, they talk about it in this strange trippy way of being on board the craft. And people talk about their powerful mushroom or ayahuasca experiences. And that same, they struggle to define what's undefinable. They struggle to talk about the realm. That's not our realm. Like they're, they're traveling to this mystical realm and then returning, which is, which is the mythology of the owl. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, you know, so that woman was from, you know, she was, went from 
daughter who yearns to daughter who knows. And that would, that's, that's something I've been, like, I feel like people are seekers, like people who have these experiences, they're like, that's a really good single one word thing. People who, not everyone, but people who are like immersed in this are seekers. They're the, they're the people who are seeking for these answers. And, and both those examples would be perfect examples. Almost every story I've told tonight, the people are seekers, so. Wonderful, thank you so much. Oh, happily. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. So let me, um, I got a couple more, but I'll, I'll just do my one here. Uh, you probably know a two part question. What do you use for data? Today I have, a, I, I mentioned in the pre-show that I have this woman who has these, she's in her 60s, dealing things with grays, but it's, it's, of course in her 60s, it's not gonna be anything baby related or whatever. Suddenly starts having encounters again, finds these two triangles, one on one wrist, one on the other wrist. And then she has this experience uh, last Saturday evening where she has this um, thing put in her ear. She has this thing appears in her ear, is very questioning. And so we were sort of chatting about it on Facebook today. And of course, people start to attack, you know, it's like, no, well, I would say, you know, because I, I brought up the, the story of the, the song called Lights where this uh, female singer talks about lights and they're calling me home. She's afraid of the dark. And what I found is that when you go to get the data, it used to be on the free site where they used to have all this data and they pulled all the data, all the commonalities that you link. Is there a place that you go in terms of linking? Like for example, how many experiencers find triangles on their body? How many experiencers are afraid of the dark? Because this one guy was saying, no, I think that's pretty common. And I'm thinking, no, no, I think I've heard lots of stories of experiencers as kids who are they want the closet door closed mm -hmm. they're afraid of the dark and stuff but there's there doesn't seem to be any data available in order for these people to back up the fact that they're not crazy because people say no nah, no nah, you're just making this up or whatever and there are these patterns that i think you've collected but free used to have it on their site and then they pulled all that data there you know they went through the three thousand experiencers and mm -hmm. how many had to hear new experiences how many had downloads all this kind of stuff and what that's you what, for yeah. data just your own data you know, I, 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 I have read some of that stuff. I, I have Ray Hernandez book, that 800 page book. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a big, big book. Yeah. And it's like, it's just chart after chart after chart. So, so like, I'm fascinated by that stuff, but it, but it, um, I'm totally going anecdotal. Like I've, I've got, I haven't made a spreadsheet or anything. And, and I've, you know, so what I did for a while, which I thought was really interesting is I collected the questionnaires that, that were being put out. So MUFON had a questionnaire. Um, uh, Brad Steiger had a questionnaire. Um, uh, Bud had a questionnaire. Uh, death experience Jacobs. Yeah. So like these are questionnaires for experiencers. And, the, and what I was looking for the commonalities and the questions, and there were some weird ones. Are you afraid of closet doors? That's a like, yeah. you're afraid of closets. That's a funny one. And I, and that's common. So I have no fear of closet doors, but some of them were like, one of them was consistent throughout all of them was, do you have, a, what's your sense of mission? Some, it was, that question was phrased in all of them. So I was curious what the researchers were, were seeing as patterns. Um, I, you, I said something at the beginning and I want to get back to it uh, as far as a pattern that I'm seeing. Oh, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. It would be it would be interesting if you were to do an article on it because you got a, quite a bit of data. I don't have the data. I never really paid any attention to it. But for experiences, when they when they when they see this kind of stuff, because they'll come to you and they'll say like, "I'm afraid of the dark," or "I have these triangles." And then you go, "Well, it happens all the time. It does." And and it sort of gives them some validation when they realize that this is common. That they think that they're like Mister Weird Street, especially the triangles. That's the same sort of thing as is why does the alien wake you up? It's like why does he put a triangle on your body? And it's, it's this, to me, it's like this weird thing is like, no, that wasn't a dream. No, no, that's, that was for real. Or why do they put your clothes inside out and backwards, which I've had lots of times mm -hmm. where in fact, one guy just died here, an experience here where I live. And he, I said, you had that experience, didn't you? He said, yeah, I got, took a photo of it. And he takes this photo of himself with the shirt inside out and backwards, which indicates it's just this idea. But most people, when that happens to them, they think they're going nuts. They don't realize this is a common pattern, but there's no I, data as far as I know that's out there where it, all these things are actually tracked, where an experiencer can go and say, oh, you know, this is this is common. It's anecdotal. I mean, there might be some leading stuff, but I mean, it's it's researchers by researcher. It's anecdotal. I, I, there was a one woman, um, her main name, Mich Michelle Levine. She wrote a book called uh, the, the, uh, 
Alien Abductee Survival Guide. It's a great book. And um, it's, I think it's hard to find now, but she has this great story about going to bed with like her t-shirt that she loved, a queen. She got it yeah. at the concert, queen t-shirt. And she woke up in the morning with a Tweety Bird t-shirt on, a yellow Tweety Bird t-shirt. She's like, where's my cool t-shirt? <laughs> like somehow, so someone else woke up at some other place with the queen t-shirt and she's never found it since. So um, the um, I, what I was going to say is, like, here's a weird little thing. Like, I I have a, there's nothing to see. I mean, you have to, like, I have a triangle, three dots on my left wrist, wow. right about here. Um, my right wrist, excuse me. And, um, no, it's on my left wrist. It's my left wrist, right about here, sorry. And, and I had it as a little kid. And I remember walking to school and being a little kid and being able to see these three perfect dots, perfect equilateral triangle, tiny, you know, maybe all of like, uh, you know, half an inch, a little smaller than half an inch, perfect. And um, I, I, but I have to, what I can do now is I can shave the hair on my arm and see it, but it gets kind of lost in the hair on my arm right now, right there. So as a little kid, I didn't have hairy arms like that, but I could see it totally clearly. It's faded a lot. I mean, I was 10, now I'm almost 60. So that's 50 years ago. Um, and so, but it's still there. I took a picture of it. I wrote a little article on it and put it on my blog without a doubt, like by a factor of 10, that gets more hits than anything on my blog. And the title of the blog post is three dot triangle star, triangle scar left wrist. <laughs> and what it tells me is people are Googling triangle. I have like, I have this weird triangle thing on my wrist. I'll go type it into Google. And then my, my blog post comes up. So that without a doubt of all the things I have on my blog, it's like 900 posts on my blog. That is far and away the most popular one. So that tells me that it is very common. And then I'll also say that that's like my job now is to get back to people and say, oh, you know, the stuff you said, that's actually pretty common. Yeah. What you said, you know, like that, I hear that story often enough. And, I, and sometimes I have to take a step back where they won't tell exactly the same story, but they'll t tell a story with a similar flavor or tone. Like it's, well, it's obviously not exactly the story that I've heard before, but I've heard similar stories with that same, with that same power. And often that power implies afterward, the person like having this kind of mystical shock that the, that the synchronicity or the, or like, it's not just the UFO sighting, it's going well beyond UFO sightings that the, the UFO sighting with the associated synchronicities and owls um, yeah. really f shatters them. And then they reach out to me and say, oh, just what you've said. I've heard that many times. Yeah, I think that's important because they come to you and I like almost like we're doctors. It's like you see something on your, you've got a, a pain in your, your whatever. And then you go to the doctor and he says, oh, that's just this. And as soon as he tells you, oh, yeah, it's very common. Don't worry about it. And then you go, oh, okay. And it's, it's all gone. But until then, you think you've got cancer. You're going to die. And I think it, it, that's where I, I find I, can, I don't have that much that I can really give to experiencers um in terms of the things that they're describing but i know in the back of my mind i'm going no no this is common this is mm -hmm. and that's what i say to them and it, it makes, basically makes them feel better and then they open up more about what they're what they've experienced exactly I exactly yeah and and then they'll and you can hear them like sometimes you'll be in the chat box with things or they you know the email come back like oh my god thank you for saying that i had no idea i'm so relieved that i'm not alone and i'm like you are not alone like this is very common yeah any other questions, Nicole and Sinead? I don't. I'll just agree with you on what you just said. You know, more often than not in experience or groups online, it is just that simple act of, you know, people sharing their stories and finding commonalities that, you know, that bring people peace. And I tracked down about 700 orb stories. That's when I realized I wasn't special <laughs> and it was comforting. So... Thank yeah. you guys both for doing what you do, you know, and helping other experiencers just by sharing this and the chats we have on these shows. I, I hear feedback like that as well. It's like, oh, you know, I always thought that, or I heard you guys discuss this and I always get replies afterwards. So it'll be nice to see what people say about this chat. So, and that's been, a, that's been a, like, I've like at the end of the day, I feel good about what I'm doing. 
right? It's a little bit like, no, my brother thinks I'm crazy. Like, you're like, what are you doing? Like, how do like, but it's, you know, like, oh my, I'm like, people thank me, like really thank me in a heartfelt way. Like, like that's a, any, any job that you have where people do that is, you know, so like I wrote these books, they are not written for the general public. They're written for people who are, mm-hmm. have one foot in this, immersed in this mystery. Right. I have to jump in here with a question. Have you ever heard from owl people, like like from university owl people? Or somebody yeah. who's like, studies owls? And say, what's this all about? Like some, like an ornithologist that's actually yeah, studying yeah. owls? Yeah. Like, almost never, actually, a little bit. You know, what I do hear from is, is um, people studying shamanism. So like at the other end of the spirit animal thing, and I actually, um, I, I can't remember the name. It was a, it's a, it's a Catholic college in New Jersey. I'm drawing a complete blank of the name. Um, a really respected Catholic college in New Jersey. And they, um, you know, with a straight, it's not a, not a, it's a secular curriculum. Um, but uh, uh, the, this book, The Messengers, the blue book, was, yeah. was given as an assignment for a modern folklore class. Wow. And I was like, I thought for a second, like, that is the perfect book for that. Like it was, it's written present day and it's about basically, and they, so that was, they read the the whole class, read the book and then discussed it as, as modern folklore. And I was like, that is actually, I, I I applaud that. That's a great way to frame this. And folklore has its own power, right? You know, so you have a bit of folklore. It resonates within people. Like, I don't really care if people believe this. I do care that they, that they recognize that there's mythologies in place and that, that people are having. So, so my thought is that there's an ancient, there's an ancient meaning in a folkloric sense, sense or a mythological sense to the owl and that these stories are still happening present day in this. So that the, we don't have ancient mythologies we don't talk about that around the dinner table like we might have you know around the campfire but we still this the experiences are still happening so instead of going to the shaman at the edge of the village they're coming to me to tell their stories so Sinead have you got anything you want to ask before we close here no pretty much what Nicole said you know I don't have any more questions at the moment but just um well what all of you said really that 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 experience of um, of validation and of meeting community is, is so incredibly important, I think, for, for all the people that are having unusual experiences. And they're, you know, what's still fascinating to me is that I had no idea how many people have experiences like this until I started meeting other people who had experiences. Oh. You know, I mean, I really did not think that that many people, that this many people all over the world had these experiences and that so many of them, so many of us, you know, kept it uh, on the down low for so long because of all those reasons that we all know of, you know, the stigma and the being told you might be crazy or you're oversensitive or you're imagining things or whatever it is. So that experience of validation really is so incredibly powerful and so incredibly important. And the community is such a big part of that. And I think that this is a different kind of, like Nicole was talking about gratitude earlier. You know, I think the gratitude that people feel when they have their experiences validated is not the same kind of gratitude we might feel in other areas of our life because these experiences are telling us who we really are. And I feel like that's the real inherent power of of these conversations, of the validation, of the community, of the stories, of all of it. It's, It's waking us up to who we really are. And we really need that. All of us need that. And we know when we have that experience, we recognize it. We recognize how much we need it, you know. So I think um, I think it's wonderful that you're doing this work, Mike, and that you have these books out, and all these people feel like they can come to you. I think that's really, 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 you know, important on so many different levels. Yeah. So thank you for all the work that you're doing and for being here tonight to share it with us too. You're very welcome. And and I and I, the the topic that originally started this was the artist topic, and so like I was. Like I was drawing cartoons. That was my job. Like I drew cartoons for magazine articles and stuff like that. Like I was a cartoonist. So I was like on the social strata, like cartoonism, it's pretty, pretty down there, pretty low. Like you have a permission to be kind of goofy and, and playful. And so I was, so when I, like, I wasn't the president of the bank when I came forward with my experiences and I kind of, so I was that being an artist or an illustrator 
like allowed me to 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 share this stuff publicly and i will say to people out there um you know think really caught be really cautious about coming out and talking about this stuff at the same time i have had almost no pushback like i have had almost no negative experiences the negative experiences i've had connected to me coming forward are so minimal it's maybe an eye roll every once in a while from someone but I don't know what people are saying behind my back, but no one has said anything negative really to my, of any meaningful way that to my face. So the times have changed. And so I've come forward with this stuff with almost zero backlash. Yeah. Last question. And then we'll wrap it up a, or sort of like a two part question. What, what do you think, if any, and you're speculating, is there a main message behind all this stuff, paranormal stuff that's happening. Uh, and the other thing is, what are you working on and uh, in, in regards to what's coming up next for you? So the main message, like I've had to boil this down because you can kind of say, oh, like it's an environmental message or it's, oh, it's our, our spirituality is, hasn't kept up with our technology. But so the, the main message is, you know, for me, and because I've had to boil this down, like, because there's like a lot of yeah. little messages that you can kind of, what's the, so I would say the main message is that there is a deeper reality beyond this reality here. Like this reality here with the hard table and the, you know, the clock ticking one second at a time. There's something grander just beyond our, our available perception. And, and that. I mean, that's where you get the question of what is God, you know, where, you know, what's our purpose? What's so, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, it's, all, it's almost like you've stolen Jacques Vallée's message. It's a giant kabuki theater. And the only message is we're not alone, that something's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's once again, the, I can't understand the, the agenda of the people behind the, or, you know, like the grand chess player, you know, the kabuki theater puppeteer. Um, but I can say that it's, that something's happening yeah. and and then maybe when we die we'll be enlightened and we'll understand it all or or so but for now we're stuck here we can tickle the corners of it but we'll never know it completely so yeah i think do you see it like a super bowl like i do like you know i, I always say most of the world lives in lives of quiet desperation and you and i got to play in the super bowl like this, if you understand what this is oh most, yeah the wildest thing that you could possibly be doing yeah yeah i think about it and and at the same time it's like you still gotta like you know put gas in the gas tank yeah. and like you still gotta do the dullest stuff you know you gotta you know yeah. we're still burdened by the absolutely pragmatic stuff that you, yeah. you're required to do to be a person so but yeah but at the same time like i marvel and i just am so grateful for for that this invaded my life because it has allowed me to, I basically open my email inbox and am just confronted with magic. You know, magic comes spilling out in every, not every email, but a lot, you know, like that's what, you know, most people aren't calling me by the phone and sometimes you go to a conference and people talk to you. It's the same thing. You know, you interact with someone, this magic spills out just tonight, just talking here and hearing what little I heard from, I like, I didn't know anything about the, the other folks that are here on the show. Like, you know, Nicole and Sinead, it, it, and I knew a little bit about Desta, but you know, this is um, like, we're not alone. This is, this is powerful stuff and it feels great to share it. Beautiful. And what are you doing now? What's, what's, what's new for Mike? What are we, what, what's going to be coming from you? I've got a couple little projects going. One of them is a, like I started a novel a while ago and I, I kind of put it on hold and I'm like, feel like I got to finish. It'll be a short novel, but I got to, I feel like I got to finish that. And um, I've been trying to promote the audiobooks and stuff like that. And there's a third audiobook. So I'll have all three books, three books and three audiobooks. The third, they'll all be as audiobooks soon. There's one final one that needs to go up there, which was actually the first one, which is the longest book. And that will be coming up online soon. I, I absolutely appreciate your coming on and we can do it again. Uh, I, I maintain you are the, maybe the best storyteller in ufology. I just like, uh, just, you just, and a wonderful way of telling it. So I want to thank you for, for joining us and hopefully you can join me on this next little thing at the end of the week. It's like a half hour thing, which is, but it's a pretty big audience. We're, 
hopefully I can help you get your message out and uh, Great. we can, we can share stuff and uh, try to unravel this thing or just at least get entertained by, um, by what we're doing. So thanks a lot. And thank you to Sinead and to Nicole and to Desta, who's in the background taping. And uh, are you going to be at any conferences this year? We may run into you. You know, everything with the COVID stuff, that's all kind of shut down and stuff like that. There was one that in Michigan, um, the Michigan UFO Con, which is usually around September in Knockwood, hopefully the like the yeah. global situation will settle down enough in the upcoming months we'll I'll be able to attend that. So, Okay, hopefully we see you down the road. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you to everybody for being a part of this. You're very welcome. Thank you. Everybody. Great meeting everyone else too. So. It's nice to meet you everybody. too. Thank you. <laughs>